Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Anne's Episcopal Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's a pleasure to be with you all. This is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, something we'll talk about in just a few moments. Uh, As I mentioned uh, last week and for several weeks prior now, this Sunday is our instructive Eucharist, so uh, prepare to hear me talk quite a while, but I also have structured it to keep us within a reasonable amount of time too, so fear not. We won't, we won't run into an extended uh, occasion today, but I um, want to thank you all for being here. It's a blessing to have you with us. Those of you who are joining us online, thank you for being with us as well. This is a fun opportunity for us to really reflect on the why of what we do in worship. Uh, And this is part of our larger theme for our program year of the why of the church, why we exist, what we're on about, who we are, why we do what we do. So I have, uh, before we start kind of the traditional part of the service that you all will be familiar with, with the procession in, um, I have about five minutes of material that I'd like to talk to you about. And I'm actually going to invest here in uh, the sanctuary this morning so that you can kind of see how I vest and and, uh, uh, some of the prayers associated with that. But I'm going to start with the uh, introduction that is in the bulletin, and I invite you to follow along if you'd like to read or just listen, Um, but I'm going to kind of explain what we're doing today and then have a little bit of uh, sort of information about what we do. And Mike, go ahead and pull up the first slide for me if you would. So our catechism, which is a Greek word used in Christianity for instruction in the faith, teaches us that among our duties to God, we are to, quote, set aside regular times for worship, prayer, and the study of God's ways. Nope, go back to the, the one the, uh, book. Yeah, there you go, perfect. Um, study of God's ways, that is from uh, page 847 in the Catechism in the back of the prayer book. Even more succinctly, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which was written by English and Scottish theologians between 1646 and 1647, those of you who maybe have worshipped at some points in your life in Presbyterian churches might recognize that statement of faith. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it is said that the chief end of humanity is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So at the outset of our service today, I want to make three quick observations about worship. First is this very point that I'm just referencing. Worship is a fundamental part of our commitment to being followers of God in Christ. However, and most importantly, there is no one right way to do that. The church has always existed in diversity with a multitude of ways in which God is glorified and adored. And I reference, I bring this up on the screen because I want to uh, commend to you all this book. It's 150 pages. It's very, very short. And it's by the most preeminent New Testament scholar of the 20th century, a Roman Catholic priest and and, uh, professor named Raymond Brown. And what he did in this book is he actually went back to the New Testament text, looked at the Gospels, looked at the epistles of Paul, looked at the other pastoral letters, and he tried to describe what the different Christian communities must have been like, what the issues were that they were wrestling with, what their visions for what the church should be looked like, And he shows, over the course of this short little book, how even from the very beginning, the church was not just one thing. It had a multitude of perspectives, and each of the different communities kind of had a different way in which they understood who they were as the church. And he sort of argues that's why we have multiple Gospels, because each of these communities had a particular way of thinking about who Jesus is. So I want to make sure that as we talk about who we are today, that we also recognize that we exist among a number of different traditions. We're not just one thing. And if you go to the second slide, Mike... Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, And just to locate us, and I know this is very fine print, but I will email out this PowerPoint so you can see it. This is um, 
often referred to as the branch theory, and it's somewhat controversial, but I find it helpful for things like this. If we think about early Christianity, basically more or less being unified. Now, as I say, there were different communities from the very beginning, but at the Council of Ephesus in 431, there was an initial kind of split off where there were some churches that disagreed with the findings of that council. And then over the centuries, you have different splits that happen for various reasons, different debates, different challenges that arise. Till today, where you have all of these different forms of Christianity. And I want to just highlight two, or two to three things really quickly. One, if you look, we come from this red line, which is what we would call today the Roman Catholic Church or the Catholic Church. It was the European Christian uh, community that was centered on Rome and the power structure in Rome. And that's where uh, the Protestant traditions branched off in, during the Protestant Reformation. However, earlier on in the 11th century, there was a thing called the Great Schism, where churches in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, so this would have been Constantinople and further east, they split off over some theological differences, and that's what we call Eastern Orthodoxy today. And there are other churches that are also in the eastern part of the world, sort of the Middle East and into Asia, that are uh, earlier branches off that are also considered sort of part of Eastern Christianity. And I want to just highlight that because as we talk about how we do our service, how we conduct our worship, we have influences that come both from the Catholic tradition in Europe and that Eastern tradition. So we're gonna have some elements that blend that in our modern worship today. The second point I want to make is that diversity aside, we have a received tradition out of which we worship. And that tradition is helpful to understand. Um, and I kind of go into some detail about that in this write-up. I'm not going to read it verbatim. But I just want to note that there was a liturgical rite that was used at Salisbury Cathedral in England. It became known as the Serum Rite. And when Thomas Cranmer, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury when the Church of England split from Rome, when he wrote the first Book of Common Prayer or compiled the first Book of Common Prayer, he was largely using material from the Serum Rite. Now, he, he drew from some other sources too, but the Serum Rite is at the heart of kind of how we worship. And it's basically a Protestant version of the much more elaborate, much more complex Serum Rite. When we get into the modern era, uh, there is a sort of effort in the 19th century to recover some of the pageantry and some of the complexity of the Serum Rite. And I was formed in an Anglo-Catholic setting, Anglo-Catholic experience. So a lot of what I do, a lot of the kinds of acts that I perform are things that come out of more or less that serum tradition. So the reasons why I bow at certain points, the reasons why I use certain what are called manual acts, the things I do with my hands in the service, a lot of that is based on that original medieval serum uh, material and how the priests would have functioned in that setting. Um, I don't have enough time today to go into all of the different details, but if that's something you're interested in, please feel free to talk to me more about it. I'd be happy to do sort of another, maybe forum hour presentation at some point where I'd go into all of those particular details. The third and uh, last sort of major thing I want to talk about today is that the Episcopal Church presently worships out of our 1979 Book of Common Prayer. And it is the fourth edition of a prayer book in the US. And if we take the English antecedents, it's the eighth prayer book in our tradition. Now, as the Anglican communion has developed around the world, most other Anglican provinces or independent churches have created their own prayer book. So it's not that there are just eight books of common prayer everywhere. There are eight books of common prayer for our particular American lineage of the Church of England and what we would call the Anglican tradition. In our prayer book, the, all of the additions up to the 1979 prayer book are very, very similar structurally 
to the ones that came before. So if you were to look at the 1928 prayer book, some of you may even have grown up worshiping with the 1928 prayer book. It would feel very similar to going all the way back to the 1662 prayer book. But in the middle of the 20th century, there was an ecumenical movement to identify different elements of liturgy that were common to one another. And those elements are called, uh, or that effort was called the liturgical renewal movement. And the liturgical renewal movement made our liturgies sort of more similar to one another. It took out the things that were unique, or took out the things that were unique and looked for the elements that were more universal, as it were. And that tradition is where we have um, the, the uh, prayer book that we have today, which is not very similar in many ways to its earlier antecedents. But it does mean that today when we worship here, if you were to go to say a Roman Catholic church or um, you know, another uh, Presbyterian church, for example, um, the liturgies are actually gonna feel pretty similar because all of those traditions were influenced by this liturgical renewal movement. Okay, uh, Mike, can you put up the screen one more time? The one other thing, uh, go ahead and move forward. And this is just a quick, this is on page 400 of the prayer book, but this is, this is the, the, these are those universal elements. So these are all of the things that, that take place uh, kind of in common, as it were. Um, and then move forward one more time. The one other thing that I want to note uh, before we start the service uh, in earnest, move forward one more, if you can. Okay, uh, this is a house that exists in Dura Europus, Syria. And it, uh, Dura Europus was founded in 300 BC and was abandoned somewhere in the period between 256 to 257 AD. However, that house church, and I don't, something, oh, there we go. That house church is the earliest known Christian church in the world. Unfortunately, uh, it's, it's likely that this footprint no longer exists because of ISIS, um, but up until the 2000 teens, uh, you could still go to Dura Europus and visit this location. If you move forward, uh, Mike, this was the house that was converted into a church, and number four here, this long rectangle, was identified as the assembly room. There's a dais on that assembly room. That's the little rectangle down at the bottom. And it's believed that that's where the altar party, as it were, the leaders of the service would stand and worship and everyone would stand behind them. What's interesting about that is that that dais is east-facing. Now, can someone tell me what's strange about an east-facing dais in Syria? Syria is to the east of Jerusalem, and so if you're facing Jerusalem, you would actually want to be on the west side, not the east side. And so there's a tradition when we talk about, and I've even done this, when I talk about why I face east, I, I am orienting us to Jerusalem, but that's not always true. The east-facing orientation is very ancient in the church, but it was more a theological orientation. We face east to the rising sun, to the coming Christ. We face east because that is the orientation of what God is doing anew, not looking to the west, sort of behind us to the setting sun. And so even in places that were east of Jerusalem, the orientation was still east facing. Um, one final note about uh, what I do and then I'm going to vest. You will notice that at many points during the liturgy, I stand and face east. There is a theological reason for that. When we think about what we're doing as an assembly, I am the first among equals. We have orders of ministry in the Episcopal Church, so we have bishops, priests, deacons, but if you look at the catechism again, we're taught that everybody is a minister. Everybody has a role to play in the priesthood of all believers. And so when I function in my ordered ministry, I am functioning as a representative of the congregation in relationship to God. And it is all of us together who are worshiping. It is not just me at the altar doing what I do. 
It is all of us together. And I find it's much more theologically powerful for me to be on the same side with you joining in those prayers as we all orient ourselves in the same way. When I am behind the altar facing you, there's a sort of separation. It kind of sets me apart from you. And I think it's much more provocative to think about the fact that we're all doing this together. I will say, and there are people that think going around the altar is a very modern invention. Uh, and most of you probably, some of you actually at least, will remember having grown up in situations where the priest was always facing with his back to you. However, the most ancient liturgy that we still have existing, the liturgy of St. James of Jerusalem, which dates to the very earliest centuries of the church, is oriented with the priest behind the altar. That's called a versus populum position. So that idea of the priest being behind facing the congregation is also very ancient. So again, there's no right or wrong way of doing this. It's all about preference. It's all about theology and what you're understanding you're doing. For me, the reason I face East for so much a part of the service is because of that importance for me of representing myself as the head of the assembly instead of something separated from the assembly. One final note before we get started. I wear a number of vestments during the service. Now, you will see there are a variety of different ways in which these vestments are built, constructed. Um, you have different vestments sort of for different occasions. We have developed a kind of practice in the Episcopal Church of using certain vestments for certain types of services, but none of that is really historical. Honestly, the reason why we have a variety of different vestments is from different parts of Europe. Some vestments were built and constructed for warmer climates. Some vestments were built and constructed for cooler climates. And quite literally, the reason we have the different vestments is because of regional variations. But they are more or less all of the same thing. What I wear is considered a traditional amos, which is this white cloth. It goes over... Uh, my cassock, and a cassock is not a liturgical uh, uh, vestment. It was considered just day-to-day -day wear by the priest. Now, it's become liturgical because most priests don't wear cassocks all the time anymore, but the amos immediately goes over the cassock, and then you cinch it off, and there's a prayer that goes with each vestment, so I'm going to pray those as I put them on. While putting on the amos, I pray, place, O Lord, the helmet of salvation upon my head to repel, to repel the assaults of the devil and all evil. While I put the amos on, which is this sort of outer garment, it dates, it's a Roman era garment, and that's most of our vestments are Roman that were then uh, sort of theologized to have additional meetings over the centuries. While I put the alb on, cleanse me, O Lord, and purify my heart, so that being made white with the blood of the Lamb, I may obtain everlasting joy. And then we wear a cincture or a girdle. You might hear it called a girdle sometimes as well. And when I put on the cincture, I pray, Gird me, O Lord, with the belt of purity, and quench in me the fire of desire, so that the grace of restraint and chastity may abide in me. And then I put on the stole. And today, I, I don't actually know why this is the case. Um, I, don't, I don't have a clear sense of this. But it's considered that the barest liturgical vestment is a stole. So if you're celebrating the Eucharist, even if you're just wearing your, your regular clericals, you would almost, you know, I mean, it, it's sort of expected that you would wear a stole for the Eucharist. Uh, everything else is somewhat optional. But putting on the stole. Give me, O Lord, the stole of immortality. And although I am unworthy to come before you, grant that I may obtain salvation. And, and finally, this outer garment is called the chasuble. And it's worn just for Eucharistic services. So if we were doing, for example, morning prayer, I would not wear this. But this chasuble... When you put it on, you pray. Lord, you have said my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Grant that I may so bear it as to obtain your grace. Amen. And these are prayers that I will pray in the sacristy uh, or in the vesting room um, as I am preparing to come into the service. Also, because of my coming out of an Anglo-Catholic background, there are some additional prayers that I generally pray uh, that are historic to the Western Church, to um, the, the Serum Rite, but uh, are, again, not things that are required. There's um, a lot of that that is sort of up to personal choice. Um, happy to talk about that in more detail at some other point. But I'm going to go back to the back now and... Uh, traditionally, you would have an entrance with the cross, with the gospel book, and with the altar procession. Uh, so we will begin uh, today without any music. We're just going to come straight in. I will reverence the altar, and then I'll talk just a couple of minutes about some liturgical elements that we will experience after that. Go ahead, Mark. In just a moment, we're going to go through what is called the entrance rite. It is a set of initial prayers in which we begin the service before we come to the pieces of the service that vary every week. The pieces of the service that stay the same all the time are called the ordinary. And then the pieces that change every week, like the collect of the day and the readings, the lectionary readings, those are called the proffers. So a proffer is something that changes and an ordinary is something that stays the same. The entrance rite pretty much is just an ordinary. Um, the one piece that's interesting in the Episcopal tradition, this is something we've retained and isn't common in other uh, churches like, say, the Roman Catholic Mass, is the Collect for Purity, which, as I mentioned, is one of those serum rite pieces, and it was part of the private prayers that the priest would say while getting vested, while getting prepared, but Thomas Cramer really liked it and felt it was appropriate for the whole congregation to hear. Also, Thomas Cramer did not like private prayers. He did not think that they were right, and so pretty much all of the prayers in the original prayer book were expected to be prayed in the presence of the community. Uh, so the Colic for Purity is a way of sort of preparing our hearts and preparing ourselves for what we are about to do in worship. I come in and I bow in reverence at the center of the altar. Um, traditionally, you would only bow if there's not a tabernacle, which is the... Um, box that would be behind the altar holding the reserved sacrament. If you were to genuflect, which is to bow down on your knee, you would tend to orient your genuflection to where the sacrament is. However, I generally come and genuflect at the altar, recognizing the sort of traditional pattern, but also the importance of what we do at the altar, too, in celebrating the Holy Eucharist. Um, so it's just, again, personal preference. The reason I come to the right-hand side, this is called the epistle side of the altar, is again just one of that uh, sort of serum rite practices I've incorporated, but people will do all sorts of different things, and there's no one right way. It's just sort of my personal preference. So I will now begin the service, and we will begin with our traditional opening dialogue. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
And now we will say together the Gloria, which is a very ancient hymn of praise. And uh, the earliest liturgies we have have a series of different hymns of praise. Uh, the Kyrie, which is still in right one. Uh, the Trisagion, holy God, holy and mighty, uh, holy immortal. That's another one that would be used as well. Uh, but the Gloria has been the one that sort of maintained itself throughout the centuries. And Thomas Cranmer chose it because most people knew it. So that's why uh, we use it so regularly, because it's something that we can kind of uh, uh, almost do uh, uh, from rote because we're so familiar with it. And it helps us, again, sort of get out of our minds and center ourselves in our hearts. So let us say together the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. In just a moment I will continue the dialogue for the Collect of the Day, but we now move into those elements that we, are, we call proper, which are the specific elements uh, that change every Sunday. The collect of the day is one that sort of centers us in what we will hear in the lessons. A number of our collects in the prayer book were written by Thomas Cranmer. Some of them are ancient Sarum Rite collects as well. So it's a variety of different material. Uh, but we will pray that collect and then we will immediately go into the lessons. I'll mention just very quickly that lessons have varied and changed throughout the centuries. There's never been a, a sort of super consistent lectionary. There was one uh, for many years within the medieval period in Europe called the Western Lectionary that was an epistle and gospel reading for every Sunday. Um, and that was the lectionary that Thomas Cramer initially used and actually was used in our prayer book all the way through 1928. In 1979, again with Roman Catholics, with Methodists, with a number of other traditions, we worked to help create the Revised Common Lectionary, which is what we use now. And uh, it has an Old Testament psalm, New Testament, and gospel lesson for every single Sunday. So we will hear all of those, and then we will have uh, some further reflection after that. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And I invite you now to be seated. And I typically use language that comes from the Eastern Church. I say, let us attend to the wisdom of Holy Scripture. A reading from the Old Testament. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember that Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. 
You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. The word of the Lord. This morning's psalm is Psalm 19, found on page 606 in the Book of Common Prayer or in your leaflet. We will read it responsively by the half verse, except for the last verse, which we will read in unison. The heavens declare the glory, glory of God. One day tells its tale to another. Although they have no word or words or language, and their voices are not heard. their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep he has set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion runs forth. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it. Again, Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The, law. the law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives life to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. More to be desired are they than gold, much more, much than much fine gold. Sweeter far than honey, than honey in the jar. By them also is your servant enlightened. And in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. And together, let the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. A reading from the New Testament. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through the faith in Christ, the righteousness from God-based faith, on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attend, attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, 
I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you all to stay seated for just a second. One thing that you will notice in the course of our typical worship is that there are certain actions that Deacon Janice will perform when she is with us. And there are roles that have historically been demarcated for diaconal ministry. The importance, the theology behind those roles is to call us to the attention of what we hear in our service, how the service is uh, um, transforming and, and renewing us in our spirit, but then also how that transformation and renewal sends us back out into the world to minister. So that diaconal ministry is very much one of this sort of intermediation between what it is we do in this place and what impact that has for us out into the world beyond. And that's why there uh, are um, the, the spaces in which Deacon Janus performs that role is to call us to attention to those elements, the proclamation of our faith in the Nicene Creed, the proclamation of the gospel, uh, the dismissal at the end of the service. So um, that's, that's a particular role. Again, something I'd be happy to talk more about uh, at some point further if you would like to have that conversation. One note, I mentioned the practice of private prayers. Um, there are certain things that I maintain, even though um, they, they are not necessarily always a part of Anglican worship uh, across the Anglican communion. Um, but again, sort of out of my Anglo-Catholic uh, background. Um, and one of them is a short prayer that is said either uh, by me uh, uh, when I am preparing to pray uh, the gospel, or pro proclaim the gospel, or a prayer I pray over Deacon Janice when she proclaims the gospel. And that prayer is, of course, as I am uh, standing here, I have completely blanked. Um, May the Lord be upon my heart and upon my lips that I may proclaim her gospel worthily and well. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I invite you all to stand. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenant seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that, build, that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. 
the gospel of the Lord. I speak to you this morning in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So if you look at the footnotes in the bulletin for this morning, you'll notice that there is a small reflection on sermons or homilies. You will see the words used uh, more or less interchangeably. There are some very uh, small nuances, uh, as I understand it definitionally, but uh, it's, it's basically the same thing. And, and so you'll hear uh, that same term used in this context. And basically, a sermon or a homily is an exposition of Scripture, uh, and it's an element of the Eucharistic service that dates to the very earliest centuries of the church. It had largely fallen out of regular use in most of Europe, however, by the medieval period. Several reforming movements, even before the Protestant Reformation, like monastic groups, think the Franciscans, the Dominicans, uh, re-emphasized the importance of preaching. And since the time of the Protestant Reformation, and since Thomas Cramer's compilation, compilation of the first prayer book, some form of sermon or homily has always been required for Holy Communion within the Anglican tradition. Now, uh, interestingly, before uh, this sort of modern era where we have m pretty much all uh, uh, um, seminary trained clergy or, or clergy that go through some amount of training to be ordained, um, there were people who would be sort of lay leaders of uh, a community or sometimes even ordained, but ordained without a whole lot of training. And so there were a set of preaching homilies that were compiled, and you were instructed that if you, if you weren't sort of up to the caliber of someone who was a good preacher, you would just read whatever the appointed homily was for that Sunday, um, and you had to be recognized as someone who was able to be preached, or able to preach on your own, and be authorized to do that. Um, I'm going to make just a couple of quick notes about sermons themselves, or about homilies. Uh, as I say, they're very ancient. They go back to the earliest forms of liturgies that we have. St. Gregory, excuse me, St. Gregory the Great, who's considered one of the uh, preeminent uh, church fathers in Christianity, observed that the preacher should be sensitive to the mind of his hearer and never overtax it. For the string of the soul, for the string of the soul, when stretched more than it can bear, can very easily snap. For all deep things should be covered up before a multitude of hearers and scarcely open to a few. Every preacher should give forth a sound more by his deeds than by his words. By good living he should imprint footsteps for men to follow rather than speaking, uh, rather than by speaking show them the path of truth. And I apologize for this sort of uh, anachronistic use of men there. But the important point is that even then there was a recognition that sometimes sermons, homilies can get so convoluted, so heady, so intellectualized that they have no significant import for the hearers of that homily. And so he was calling people back to a place of paying attention to the fundamentals. What is going to help the community of faithful live more authentically, more fully into their Christian witness? Pope Francis in this modern era has uh, on numerous occasions emphasized that homily should be no more than eight minutes. And uh, I'm sure that you all would love that. I uh, regrettably violate that rule almost every single Sunday. Um, but there's, there is a continuing emphasis on the power of what we do in the homiletical task. Homilies, uh, uh, that's where that word comes from. I want to just note that I do think there is an interesting connection with our readings today and what we are doing. If you look especially at the parable that Jesus is talking about with this landowner, we see at the end that what the Pharisees are realizing is he's calling out their hypocrisy, the ways in which they have this kind of self-righteousness about what they do. 
And in a sense, if we connect that to our hearing of the Ten Commandments in our Old Testament lesson, it can become idolatry. We can become so fixated on the rightness or the uniqueness of what we do that we miss the greater work of God in the world. And one of the things I hope you come away from today is understanding a little bit more about the uniqueness of what we do, why we do particularly what we do in the Episcopal Church, but also the recognition that we are among many churches with a diversity of practices, all of which honor and adore and worship God authentically. So we are but one of many ways of approaching God in worship and in adoration. And we need to be very careful when we draw those boundary lines, trying to demarcate or separate off ourselves as the right way or the most right way or the most authentic way. Because frankly, that is not true. And we know from the work of the Spirit in this world, where we see the Spirit moving, that a diversity of practices and a diversity of peoples and a diversity of ways of worshiping God bring us closer ultimately to what the Spirit is doing now and always. So as we hear everything today, may we be uh, aware of and attuned to the Spirit moving in this place, the Spirit moving in our very hearts this day and always. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We are now going to profess, and I'll invite you to stand in just a second, the Nicene Creed. And in most ancient forms of Christian worship, the language of the Eucharistic prayer itself, which is the second half of the service where we celebrate uh, the um, institution at the Lord's Supper and re remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross um, and re-experience that in the present moment, that portion of the service was considered the pro profession of faith. It was the time at which we were understood to be professing what it is that we believe. Within the service, however, sometime before 325 AD, the challenges of heretical teaching led to a creation of a creedal affirmation. And this creedal affirmation was actually used to instruct baptismal candidates. So it was part of what you went through in order to become a baptized Christian. At the Council of Nicaea, the first Council of Nicaea, that creed that was being used for baptisms got universally applied to uh, its use in the service as a whole and became the Nicene Creed that we have today. And it was sometime around that same period in which it became a sort of core part of weekly celebrations of the Eucharist. Some Protestant reformers, when we get to the Protestant Reformation in Europe in the uh, uh, 15 and 1600s, did not like what they perceived as non-scriptural elements of the Nicene Creed. And I'd be happy to sort of talk about those again at some point too. But they instead preferred other uh, affirmations like the Apostles' Creed that they felt was more sort of holistically biblical as it were. And in a compromise with the more ancient tradition, the 1979 prayer book required the, cre the creed to be recited on Sundays and major feast days. However, if we're celebrating the Eucharist outside of those times, like if we were to do a daily Eucharist or a Eucharist on Wednesday nights, you don't have to recite the creed. But it's expected that at the principal celebration of the Eucharist on Sunday mornings that you would recite the creed every single week. So I invite you all now then to stand and let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate in the Virgin Mary. 
and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Bill, I'd invite you to go ahead and come up. And as Bill is moving to the lectern to pray, lead us in the prayers of the people, I will note that as uh, early as the second century, we have evidence of intercessory prayer following the reading and exposition of Holy Scripture during the Eucharistic service. With time, however, most of the service formularies in Europe became increasingly more private, eventually with the vast majority of prayers for the whole service just being said by the priest and the altar party, with the rest of the congregation sort of praying private devotionals in their pews. The Protestant reformers strongly desired to re-engage the whole laity in the liturgy, and this was one key element where they began doing that, where they had this sort of time of call and response in the service to involve everyone in the process of praying. And go ahead. And their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who rightly For Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Marianne, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For those in need of immediate prayer, Gerald, the Brantover family, Tiana, Andy, Aaron, presiding bishop, Michael, Jenny, Catherine, Arzu, Jonathan, Joy, Elaine, Carol, David, Jan, Jeff, Rachel, Hugh, Raffaella, Carolyn, Ruth, Benjamin, John, Avery, Clara, Kendall, Catherine, the Torres family, John and Jeff. For those who have ongoing need of prayer, Lois, Helen, Mary, Debbie and Walter, Eric and Rachel, Susan, Romeo, Bill and Penny. For those serving in the military here and overseas, Lawrence, Chris, Tony, Carl, Phil, Paul, Chris, Paul, Maria, Eric, Jay, Lauren, Philip, Rachel, Michael, Eric, and David. For the ministries of this church, St. Anne's Parish Choir, families and members of our parish, David and Patricia Baker, Andy and Ellie Barlow, Gerald and Muffy Beach, Merle Bertrand, Nancy and Paul Borgia, Deb Boyle. Hear us, Lord. Lord, your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died 
that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom, especially Kimberly Bronte, Roger Graff, Ethel Pacey. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We give you thanks, O God, our Father, for the good work which you have begun in us, for calling us to the knowledge of your grace and faith in you, and we pray you so to continue your work in us that our lives may be strengthened for your service in the fellowship of the gospel, and our love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all discernment to your praise and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I will invite you all to go ahead and be seated or to kneel as you are able for the confession. I will note you noticed during the Nicene Creed that I genuflected, bent down on one knee uh, at the mention of the incarnation. And that's again a Anglo-Catholic practice. You'll see some folks do that, some folks don't. There's nothing that is particularly uh, necessary about that. The other thing that's unique to what I do um, is you hear every week a different prayer at the end of the prayers of the people. That's from an ancient tradition where that was another one of the movable elements, another proffer. It was called a minor proffer, and every single week had a different prayer that concluded the prayers of the people. I draw on that tradition and use that. That's very unique in uh, modern Episcopal worship. If you look in the prayer book, there are sort of six concluding prayers that are usually used for the prayers of the people, and you'll often hear most priests pray one of those six, but I, I do this where I have uh, sort of a unique prayer for every week. Again, it's not required, just a, uh, a devotional sort of practice of mind that's one part of what uh, I incorporate into our worship together. So now uh, I am going to invite us to confess our sins. Um, and just a quick note about corporate confession. It was uh, either enfolded into the Eucharistic prayer or was part of the intercessory prayer, so the prayers of the people in the earliest liturgies that we have in the church. The introduction of an explicit corporate confession and absolution is a Reformation innovation uh, in the Protestant Reformation, and uh, the standard location for its element, which is what we have today, came after the homily, and that was intentional because the reformers believed that by hearing scripture and then hearing scripture explained or explicated that your heart would be moved to confess as fully as possible um, and it would also be a time of preparation then to enter into the reception of holy communion now some of you who have a familiarity or background in roman catholicism will also know about the practice of private confession or individual confession and we actually have that in uh, the uh, Episcopal Church as well, there is a liturgy for private confession, and if you ever wanted to avail yourself of it, you can feel free to contact me or another priest. Um, it is a practice by some to uh, have a private confession every week, but uh, even if you don't participate in that, we do have this corporate uh, confession that's part of our service. So now, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Now, one uh, unique, and uh, please feel free to be seated, uh, element that I had never encountered until I came here to St. Anne's 
were these three prayers that we have immediately before the passing of the peace. Um, these additional prayers are extra prayer book. They, they are sort of listed in the prayers, uh, in the back of the prayer book, but they're not a formal part of the liturgy. However, you remember I talked about Eastern Christians. This is actually part of the Eastern Christian practice to have this time in the service where you pray over birthdays, anniversaries, if people are preparing to travel, all manner of different sort of particular prayers. Uh, so this is uh, a, a, a element, a liturgical element that's shared by other Christian denominations, just not as common in the Episcopal Church. So with that said, I invite any of you who are celebrating anniversaries or birthdays or preparing to travel to come forward. All travel today? All right. <laughs> Anniversary? <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> there, oh, while you're away. All right, all right. Well, very good, very good. Well, <laughs> excuse me. Let us pray for Chris and Bill as they celebrate their anniversary. I invite you to pray with me. O oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send, therefore, your blessing upon these, your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience and wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to move over. And now let us pray for everyone who is preparing to travel. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel, surround them with your loving care, protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessings, everyone. Uh, as they return to their seats, I'll note that the exchange of a kiss of peace is well evidenced in the New Testament scripture and is a very ancient practice dating back to some of the earliest existing liturgies. By the medieval period, the practice <coughs> in churches was to only exchange the peace among the altar party. However, it was retained in this fashion by Thomas Cranmer in the first book of Common Prayer, but then disappeared completely from the liturgy. In 1662, even in 1928, there's not uh, a very clear established uh, passing of the peace. Um, it became, and it was reintroduced to us in the 20th century, by our Indian brothers and sisters in the Church of South India. Church of South India, they're the group that worship on Saturday evenings here, um, and they are part of the Anglican Communion. They come from an Orthodox background, so that, again, Eastern Christian background, and they reintroduced the practice of a community passing of the peace to the whole Anglican Communion. And so pretty much now, across the Communion, you will have a communal passing of the peace. So uh, that is one element of the service that we uh, uh, um, give thanks to them for giving to us. So I invite you all to stand. O oh God of peace, you have taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved, and quietness and confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace, peace, peace. And uh, Mark, while well, you're setting up, Bill, do you mind just moving these two things into the sure. sacristy? That would be perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Please be seated for just a few moments. I hope you will join us after the service for our coffee hour. Uh, and we have uh, a neat opportunity today. We're welcoming uh, Mother Sheila McChilton, who is our uh, um, coach for attending our soil program. So thank you, Sheila, for being with us this morning. Um, and she will uh, be with us uh, for a little bit at coffee hour to sort of talk about um, her 
uh, experience of that work and, and kind of where uh, uh, we are seeing green shoots and new life here at St. Anne's. So uh, look forward to that. I'll just offer, uh, since this is an instructive Eucharist, a quick note about announcements. Um, announcements being in the middle of the service is a controversial practice within the Episcopal Church. You might find people that have very strong opinions about whether we should be doing this or not. Um, but there is no prohibition against it. And um, the issue is that it's often seen as sort of a disruption between the first half of the service and the second half of the service. Um, however, however, uh, it's um, sort of historic to the prayer book. Some of you may remember a time when the exhortation, and the exhortation is in our 1979 prayer book, but it was used regularly in the older prayer books in 1928 going all the way back to 1549. And the exhortation was where the priest would tell you what to expect of Holy Communion, where you were supposed to be in your own spiritual life, how you were supposed to prepare yourself. And if you had not gone through those things, then you were not supposed to take communion. And it got to the point uh, by the 17th, 18th century that we have records of churches where they get through the first part of the service in the morning, the exhortation would be read, and like 90% of the congregation would get up and leave. And so you would only have these very, very small number of people who would actually stick around for communion. Um, but uh, today we use it uh, in the ways that we do to sort of make announcements um, the, the period uh, in the middle of the service is often used to, to announce baptisms and weddings coming up. So um, it has some his, history there. Um, I'm going to invite Pam up. She does have a quick announcement, and then we will transition to the second half of our service. Unlike last week, I only have one announcement today. I want everyone to mark their calendar, the Why Women Christmas Bazaar at Calvary United Meth Methodist, no, Saint, at Damascus, United Methodist Church is going to be on December, November 14th. It starts at 9 a.m. Come and get all your Christmas shopping done. And, if, and all the money that we raise goes back into the community of Damascus. So if you have a need, let us know. Come, though, to the bazaar and have a grand time. And see me if you want to join the Y Women. We meet the first and third Tuesdays of the month. It is a 56-year-old woman's group who gives everything back to the community of Damascus. In just a moment, we will, uh, I will offer the offertory sentence, um, which is an opportunity for us to begin preparing our hearts and our minds for the service of Holy Eucharist. Uh, but I'm just going to make a quick observation about the uh, service of Holy Eucharist. So if you look back at the very beginning of the bulletin, you will see that we began this, the, the service with the Word of God, which is a uh, heading that often denotes what we would call the liturgy of the Word. And it is the full sort of uh, focus of the first part of the service, where we hear readings, we hear them explained and explicated. Um, it was called uh, in, in traditional uh, Catholic and, and European practice until the modern era, the liturgy or the mass of the catechumens. It was where everyone could participate. And then the second half of the service, people who were not confirmed yet, who were not eligible to receive communion, would actually leave. As I was mentioning, this was part of the prayer book tradition as well. And in the, the, what would become the Roman Catholic tradition, that was referred to as the Mass of the Faithful. Um, and now everyone is invited to participate uh, in the full arc of the service, but we still have that separation between the liturgy of the word and what's called the liturgy of Holy Communion or the liturgy of uh, the table or the liturgy of the Eucharist. And I'm just going to read very quickly from our catechism because I think it's helpful to understand what the Eucharist is for us. The Holy Eucharist is called the Lord's Supper and Holy Communion. It is also known as the Divine Liturgy, the Mass, and the Great Offering. It is the sacrament commanded by Christ for the continual remembrance of his life, death, and resurrection until his coming again. It is called a sacrifice because the Eucharist, the church's sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, is the way by which the sacrifice of Christ is made present and in which he unites us to his one offering of himself. And then uh, when we get to the actual Eucharistic prayer itself, there are several uh, sort of key elements, and I'm going to describe those before we go through them. 
Um, so now we're going to go into the period of the offertory um, and prepare our hearts. We also have this time uh, which is called the, the uh, oblations, where we bring forward our gifts, our offerings to God. And those offerings include our financial offerings in terms of what we give each week uh, in the offering plate and the offering of the elements of bread and wine that we will then celebrate and consecrate into the uh, body and blood of Christ. And Merle, I invite you to go ahead and start passing around the offertory plate. As uh, she is doing that, I'm going to explain uh, some of what I do uh, in this process. You will notice our tradition here is to have the uh, chalice and the patent on the altar. Some churches leave it off until the Eucharist. Uh, it just varies, and there's not a particular right uh, uh, way of doing it, as I mentioned. It sort of goes back to the type of service. More formal services uh, historically would leave it off what we would call high masses, and then a low mass would actually have it on the altar like we have it now. Um, but, but those distinctions aren't really things that uh, are used very much anymore, so uh, any, any practice is okay. We have uh, this top layer, which is called the veil, and the verse, and these cover the elements. Now, you think about a veil, uh, it's, it's related to the idea of what we do it being, uh, uh, or the, the theology, that we are participating in the present moment of Christ's sacrifice. So this is, uh, in a sense, related to a lot of funerary language because we are remembering the sacrifice of Christ on, himself on the cross um, and that, that sacrifice becomes present to us in the Eucharistic prayer and in the consecration of these elements. This uh, uh, object is called, called the hard pall, um, and it is used to cover the elements when they are part of what we call the stack, which is everything put together. But then after I pour the water and the wine in, I will put the hard pall on. This is, again, an Anglo-Catholic practice. I do it sort of as a devotional thing, but do you know why it was originally done? Was to keep flies and other bugs out of the wine before you actually got to the point where you were drinking it. So it has a very functional purpose that's been theologized over time, but it's something that I continue to do. So we'll take the wine and we pour some amount of wine into the chalice, kind of depending on how many folks are present. And then in tradition, and this was true of the European tradition going back before the Reformation, we co-mingle water and wine. This actually goes back to early Greco-Roman practices, and for us it's also a remembrance of the co-mingling in Christ being both fully human and fully divine. And so there's not a separation. When the water is commingled with the wine, the two are no longer uh, uh, two separate objects, but they are wholly together in the one object of the wine in the sacrament of the blood of Christ. And there's a prayer that goes with the pouring of the water. And I have to apologize because of today, all of this stuff that I can just do by rote is not coming to me. Uh, so I'm <laughs> I apologize about that. Let me pull it up really quickly. Um, Um, by the mystery of this water into wine, may we come to share in Christ's divinity as he humbled himself to share in our humanity. And then I give the water back to the server. And then Mark will bring over a small bowl called the lavabo bowl, and he'll have a uh, um, uh, what's called a purificator draped over, and he will rinse my hands, and this is simply uh, a, a another act. I'll tell you, again, this has been theologized into something that has a sort of theological significance. However, the history is that we would traditionally, with most services, sense the altar and sense the elements. What is incense but charcoal, your hands would get dirty. 
So you would literally wash your hands after sensing the altar to remove the particulate from the censer uh, in order to then celebrate the Mass. But that has been uh, theologized again and given some, some significance. So then there's a prayer that goes with this. Cleanse me, O Lord, from my iniquities and wash away all my sins. And then there are prayers that are part of the Anglo-Catholic Mass celebration. They are generally said as part of the community, but we have musical offerings, anthems that are usually being sung at this point. So I tend to say these prayers privately at the altar, but they're prayers to thank God for the elements of bread and wine that we are receiving uh, today and that we will use to uh, celebrate the um, sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. And this prayer, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth, work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Again, all of this that I'm doing uh, is, is sort of Anglo-Catholic practice. There's nothing uh, right or wrong about it. It's, it's uh, just sort of unique um, to, to the way in which I was trained. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have received this wine which we offer you. Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. And then there is one final prayer that I usually say. Brothers and sisters, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, all, the Almighty Father. And then uh, as those prayers are being said, we would have the elements brought up. So I invite you all to bring up both the offertory elements of uh, financial offerings and the offertory elements of bread and wine. This uh, bringing forth of the gifts from the congregation is very ancient in the Eastern Christian Church, and it was known as the Great Entrance. I bless the offertory blessings, and I usually use uh, the right one prayer, um, all things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee to bless, to bless the financial offerings. Again, you will not hear most of those prayers during a regular service because we'll have music that's being played at the time that those are being done. We have a tradition since COVID of having the individual cups of wine, but traditionally, and some of you may remember this from uh, years past, you would have a, uh, a cruet, which is a glass vessel or a silver vessel called a flagon that would have the additional wine in it. So that would be brought forward. We also have additional bread, and this is what's called a ciborium, and it's what additional bread is held in. Um, and again, this is a uh, funerary reference. The ciborium is where a body is stored, a body is held. So uh, it has um, a, a uh, remembrance of this being um, the physical body and blood of Christ. Finally, uh, there is a tradition, we don't do this very often, I'll do it on occasion, of sometimes offering masses for a specific intention. So when we say the Eucharistic prayer to say it, uh, for the special purpose of lifting up someone in need of prayer. Um, and I mentioned that today because I would like to especially offer this Mass uh, to the glory of God for our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land. As you know, uh, I'm preparing to uh, hopefully lead our pilgrimage in February, um, and we have many brothers and sisters who are over there right now. The violence and the conflict is not where pilgrims are, but it's certainly impacting the whole entire region. It's a fraught situation with uh, just a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, um, and I uh, particularly want to lift up our brothers and sisters in that place today. As we move forward into the Eucharistic prayer, in order to uh, sort of keep the Eucharistic prayer holistic so that we're not breaking it up, I want to quickly tell you what the elements are. And as you follow along in the bulletin, I've color-coded them so that you will see. The Eucharistic prayer is made up of some key uh, sort of turns that happen in the language of the prayer. 
We begin with an opening dialogue called the Sursum Corda, which is the Latin for what we actually say, lift up your hearts. And then we have a recitation of praise and thanksgiving, which is called the preface. And the preface has an element that changes every Sunday, which is called the proper. So that's why you have uh, uh, a proper preface, as it were. And then after the preface, we uh, say together the Sanctus and the Benedictus Qui Venet. The Sanctus is the holy, holy, holy Lord God of power and might. And then actually, when we get to the blessed is he who comes, that's an entirely different uh, tradition. That's a, a, a sort of additional um, hymn that was attached very early on to the Sanctus. If you look in the prayer book today, if you look in the hymnal, that whole thing is called the Sanctus, but it's actually both the Sanctus and the Benedictus Quivenet. After we pray the, and, and proclaim the Sanctus and the Benedictus Quivenet, uh, we will have, and sometimes these, these elements are ordered differently after the Sanctus, but you have an anamnesis, which is a remembering, like amnesia, you think about amnesia forgetting. The anamnesis is a, a recalling. We are reminded of what God has done for us throughout history. There's always an anamnesis in every Eucharistic prayer. Then there's a memorial acclamation, or sorry, have the anamnesis, and then we have the words of institution, the exact words that Jesus said at the Last Supper where we are reminded to uh, follow in Christ's commandment, to break bread, to drink wine, to share in his suffering and his sacrifice on the cross, and to be renewed and rejuvenated in our spirit through that sacrifice, but to use the words that Jesus used at the institution of the Eucharist in the Lord's Supper. And then after the institution narrative, a memorial acclamation. This is again an Eastern Christian practice that has uh, made its way into the 1979 prayer book. It's an element in which the congregation responds in the Eucharistic prayer because so much of it is simply the priest saying things alone. It's a point at which the congregation affirms what is happening. It's a, emblematic, it's representative of all of us participating in this prayer. Even as I'm the only one saying the words, it's all of us saying it together in our hearts. And then there is an oblation, which is the Latin word for offering. And this is an oblation in the Eucharistic prayer where we offer the gifts of bread and wine to be blessed and transformed by God. And that's followed by an epiclesis, which is the praying of the Holy Spirit to come and transform these elements. So we ask God to make these elements into the physical body and blood of Christ. And then after the epiclesis, we have a supplication and a doxology. A supplication is a prayer to God that we may be spiritually renewed and benefit from our participation in the sacrament of the Eucharist. And then a doxology, which is a Greek word for the appearance of God, is a fancy word for the times at which we pray God's triune name. So we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all Eucharistic prayers end with some form of doxology. And then finally, at the very end of the Eucharistic prayer, we have the great amen where we all together affirm what it is that we have just done and we say amen together. So you can follow along with those different elements as we uh, uh, process into the Eucharistic prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, and I invite you to stand. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation and the calling of Israel to be your people and your word spoken through the prophets and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us that heavenly country where, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Anne, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. In a moment, I'm going to invite us to pray the Lord's Prayer, and I uh, just mention here that it is attested to in the Gospels because it is the way in which Jesus instructed his disciples to pray to God. Um, and there's some evidence of it being used by Christians in the earliest years of the church as a private devotion and later on became part of the Holy Communion service. So, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This breaking of the bread is called the fraction, and in the ancient practice of the church, it's somewhat precise in its origin, uh, but it's a significant symbolic meaning in that uh, we are breaking the body of Christ to share with the world, and we are breaking the unity to uh, um, expand the love of God and the truth of God to all, but we are all united in the original singularity of the body as well. So even in our diversities, we are one in Christ. And then there is a tradition of presenting the gifts of God to the people before communion. So I will offer these 
during communion, our bell choir will play, and then we will have uh, the final few elements of the service. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
what we do in this moment as we prepare for um, the final prayers is what are called the oblutions. So I mentioned a few minutes ago the practice of bringing the gifts forward is called the oblations, which are the gifts. The oblutions are a washing. They are a cleaning of the sacred vessels as they have uh, been used to celebrate the Holy Eucharist and the presence of Christ becoming manifest to us in these elements of bread and wine. We take great care to clean the vessels after uh, the celebration. It's also why the little cups, we ask that you put them in the back so that they can be properly rinsed. Um, one little trivia piece for those of you who have never been in the sacristy, all of the leftover elements that get uh, uh, um, cleaned out are poured down a special sink called the piscina that goes straight into the ground. So there's even a way of disposing of the uh, elements um, when we are finished uh, with that. So I now will uh, finish my ovulations and reset the stack. The post-communion prayer and final blessing are all attested to, and the dismissal, are all attested to by the 4th century, so by the 300s. But their use before that time is somewhat debated. The post-communion prayer functions to conclude the Eucharistic rite and to thank God for the benefits of the Eucharistic elements that we have shared. The final blessing was originally reserved for a bishop, but most Eucharistic services were only done by bishops, um, and it most often involved the laying on of hands as well. And that's now uh, the, uh, post, the, the blessing prayer that I use dates to the very first prayer book, actually. Thomas Cramer wrote the uh, uh, final blessing prayer. Um, and then the fourth century patriarch, uh, I was going to leave you with a little bit of humor, um, patriarch of Constantinople, St. John Chrysostom, once quipped, uh, and, and famously observed that those who leave after taking communion but before the final blessing are no better than Judas who participated in the Last Supper and then left before it was concluded. Uh, so there's a, <laughs> there's a sense in which this is still part of the rite. Um, I will tell you some organists may feel the same way about the postlude too, so just keep that uh, note as well. And then third and finally, the dismissal is a standard and important liturgical element which the deacon reminds us of, uh, uh, us as the assembly, of our responsibility in returning to the world outside of the church and to carry forward what we do here to the world around us. One, the recitation of a mission statement as we have here in St. Anne's um, is a non-standard and extra prayer book addition um, that we observe here. However, um, even though it's not attested to in other practices, it nevertheless offers us an important reminder, kind of like the dismissal, of what it is that we are dismissing to do, what our common purpose is as a community and what our call is as a community of faith in sharing the truth of the gospel to the world around us. So I invite you uh, sort of in the series then to pray the post-communion prayer and the hear the blessing and to do the uh, mission and dismissal together. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And for those of you who are worshiping online, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. God of truth and love, we thank you for this act of spiritual communion, even as we long for the days of gathering in community to partake of your body and blood. Renew in us that which bonds us together, our faith and trust in you, so that we may be transformed and grow in faith and love of you. Amen. And now, all together, as a community of faith, let us declare our mission. As a community of faith, 
Let us go forward to bring others to Christ through worship, witness, and love for one another and our neighbors. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. And I will invite Mark to go ahead and bring the cross out and we will begin the procession. I will tell you back in that medieval period that I've referenced earlier where the theology was that the Eucharist was only happening at the altar, the dismissal would be done from the altar. And you can go ahead and process Mark uh, because that was where the mass was happening. That logically then is where the mass would conclude. But as a recognition of all of us being a part of the service, that we are all part of of proclaiming the gospel, we now dismiss, or participating in the Eucharistic prayer, we now dismiss from the back in recognition of that fact. Go in peace to love and serve the